Well, I'm super excited that you got to see Jamie, our pastor, and Steve, the fellow elder, with me because it's kind of like we started with the first string and then we moved to the second. We're kind of down to third string here, but we'll see what we can do for you this morning. Um, you are not going to hear the King's English spoken correctly. You are not going to get insights from the uh, Prince of Preachers College where Pastor Jamie was trained. You're not going to get a handsome middle-aged guy up here speaking to you who was in the RAF. You're not going to get any of that. You get me. But next week, if you come back, Jamie is planning on speaking a lot. So we will look forward to that, Jamie. Um, I don't know why you gave Steve a gift card when it's yours and my anniversaries. I could have used it for taking the lady out, but we'll, we'll figure something out. So I hope that he uh, blesses his family with that. You know, sometimes to understand a story, we need some background that happened first. And our passage of scripture today is much like that. So I'm going to ask you to take a trip with me into the Old Testament to kind of set up what we're going to read about in Acts chapter 8. God, who had founded the earth and created humankind, watched knowing that we would turn our backs on him and move away from a relationship. But he had a plan to restore us. And to begin this work, God was going to found a nation, a special group of people. He chose a funny way to found a nation, though. He started with a man and a woman who had no children and could have no children. And he said, out of you, I will create a great nation. All the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And sure enough, when Abram was an old man and his wife was well past the age that any woman would give birth, she gave birth to a baby boy. They named him Isaac, and through Isaac came Jacob, who became Israel, who became the children of Israel, God's promised people, his chosen ones, through who he said he will bless the earth. And then maybe you remember when Jesus was born, he was born in an impossible situation to a virgin who could not have a child because she'd never even been with a man. So God brings life out of places where we never think life could come. So I got this far with my wife, kind of telling her what I was going to say, and she said, so what does that have to do with Acts chapter 8? And I said, you got to bear with me. There's a few more of these, and then we'll get to Acts chapter 8. So please stick with me in some of this history as we get ready to go there. You see, in the Old Testament, God had set up a way of getting right with him through the Israelites, through his gift of the law to help them know how to act, and through a temple where they could go to get close to him for feasts and festivals and, and throughout the year worship him. Now, God's laws were about establishing his uniqueness, his fruitfulness, his goodness, and his differentness, his holiness. So some of those laws about the temple where people went then to be close to God are found in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1 says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Well, now that's quite a verse. But what it's telling us is God is a fruitful God. He said to his people to be fruitful and multiply. So if you were maimed in a way that you couldn't do that, God said, you can't be in the temple. God goes on in verse 2 to state, no one born of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of God. Even to the 10th generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of God. So if you're impure, if you marry outside the faith, if you marry into a heathen culture, then you are not allowed to be called a Jew anymore. Don't come back to me because you have turned your back on what I had given you. God is a pure God. So no confused or mixed bloodlines were allowed to be part of his chosen people. Wow, pretty tough stuff couple more stories before we get to the book of Acts. God had set aside a special place, the temple in Jerusalem. And this is where people could come, remember, for the festivals, for the feasts, for the times of sacrifice, to make sure that their heart was staying right with God, to repent again, to recognize their need for him. And he set apart a special group of people, his priests, to do the work in the temple. Now, as a nation in the Old Testament, this Jerusalem, this place to worship God, was part of the 12 tribes. But there was a civil war 
there was a fight between the tribes of Israel and they ripped it apart and 10 tribes went off and founded their own kingdom. And the capital of that kingdom was Samaria. And they said, we're going to worship God in Samaria on Mount Ebal, where he first told us to proclaim the blessings. And we're going to make ourselves the center of religion. And we're not going to that tabernacle where the spirit of God is. We're going to create our own way to get to God. And they became enemies of the Israelites. But more so, Samaria became a city known for its immoral acts. You may remember the wicked King Ahab was king of Samaria for many years and defied God's prophets to the very end of his life. David Guzik in the Enduring Word Commentary puts it this way, Generally speaking, the Jews of the day hated Samaritans. They considered them compromising half-breeds who corrupted the worship of the true God. You see, in addition to the other things I mentioned, when Samaria had been conquered, they had taken all the learned people out and brought them to Assyria, and they had brought in foreigners who inbred with all of them. They married them and gave their children to them and everything else. So there was no pure Jewish blood left there. Lesore makes this statement. There was deep-seated prejudice amounting almost to hatred standing between the Jews and the Samaritans. Do you see why Samaria was not a place where any good Jew would be found? Why the woman at the well said to Jesus, why would you, a man, a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan, a woman? And she said, where do we worship? And Jesus said to her, what? Does anybody remember? Where do we worship? In the temple or in the mountain? In spirit and in truth. The times are changing, dear lady. The times are changing. Now let's go to our text for this morning, Acts chapter 8. By this time, Jesus has come to earth. Almighty God has walked around on earth with his people. He has sacrificed his own life. He's died. He's risen from the dead. And he has ascended to heaven, as we heard in the first chapter of Acts. So remember what we just learned. In the Old Testament, salvation was through a system showing us our neediness so that we could be drawn to God. In the New Testament, though, it's different, isn't it? We'll learn what that differences are. But first, who is this Philip that we're going to read about? The Philip we read about in this passage was present in Jerusalem as thousands had flocked to Christ when Peter preached. As the church grew astronomically, he had seen God's incredible power, and he had seen his judgment with Ananias and Sapphira, and he had seen his mercy to everyone who returned to him. And eventually, Philip had been given a very important role in the church. When people started bringing piles of money and giving them to the apostles and saying, do what you want with this to further God's kingdom, he had been appointed a deacon, someone to make sure that money got spread fairly, that widows and orphans were cared for. He had interacted with many people in the church every day, and his administrative gifts had been powerfully used by God to help the church grow and people feel loved. Let's see how Philip reacts to a very bad time in his life and what comes of it in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 3. Verse 1 says, And Saul approved of Stephen's execution. Wow. Remember last week? One of Philip's fellow deacons was murdered by a mob, and Saul had approved of it. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Paul decides to push all the Christians out of the Jewish society. Now, it might be easy to kind of skip over this and say, oh yeah, but look at all the good things that happened, but we might miss something here. Because, excuse me, because what was going on was a mighty work of God. God was building his church. He was infusing them with power and with joy and with love. And we may think that the gift of the Holy Spirit and that his actions in our lives after we're saved will lead to us living in great relationships all the time, will lead to his church just blossoming and growing. Yet in today's passage, right in the middle of God's great work, we find suffering and loss of almost unbelievable proportions. 
Did you notice the verse says Paul was ravaging the church? David Guzik in the Enduring Word Commentary says the word ravaging is an ancient Greek word that could refer to an army destroying a city or a wild animal tearing at its meat. He viciously attacked people, including women. Boyce points out that the tense of the verb used there is imperfect. That means he ripped into them and he kept ripping into them. He wasn't going to stop this persecution. Many people have to flee Jerusalem. They leave their extended families. They lose their jobs. They leave their homes. They're literally refugees escaping prison. And Philip ends up in Samaria with no power, probably no material wealth, and certainly no standing among Samaritans. He's one of the Jews, the people they hate. And what does he do? Does he start trying to raise up an army to go back with him and show Saul what he should do? Does he complain about all the suffering he's been through? No, it's a beautiful thing. He says in Acts chapter four, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And then Acts chapter 8, ver eight chapter, verse 5 gives us specific details about Philip. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. He had every reason to be bitter and vengeful. He's in a group of people that historically he has hated. Those who had intermarried with other wicked people, those who had stood out against true faith. Yet Philip goes to their capital city and starts telling them about Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Pastor Jamie said in his first sermon on Acts about the work of the Holy Spirit? He said it is always to exalt Jesus Christ. And here's Philip filled with the Spirit and exalting Christ. Acts 8 verse 8 tells us the result of that. It says, so there was much joy in that city. Now, wait a minute. In Jerusalem, there was much suffering. And now in Samaria, the place that had been against Christ, there is much joy. You see, Christ had told the disciples in Jerusalem to go into all the world and make disciples of all men, including Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the earth. But no one had gone to Samaria yet. It was a tough crowd. It was not a place you would choose to be a missionary to. So now God says, I will allow wickedness to shake my church so that instead of a holy huddle getting better and better and better, they become evangelists, reaching out and transforming the world the way that I intended them to. Remember, the work of God now is found through the Holy Spirit in the person of Christ. As a child of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, wherever you find yourself, in good times or bad, in sickness or in health, in riches or in poor, with friends or with strangers, that is the center of God's work, where you are. You see, God had birthed his church in Jerusalem. He had a temple where he used to dwell. But the Bible says now, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the place the Holy Spirit is found on earth. So where you are, God is. Too often we're looking for where we should be. Lord, where is your will? Where should we live? What should I do? What should my career be? Who do you have me to be? And he says, I am indwelling you right where you are. Begin and share what you have with others. As for Philip, there are great results. People are being healed. People are being baptized. The name of Jesus is lifted up. And then right in the middle of this great big story, Luke takes several verses to tell us about kind of what looks like a minor character. A guy named Simon shows up. Now, Simon had been powerful and well thought of in the Sumerian culture. They even said he had the power of God. He was a magician. He could do things. He was wise. He had wisdom. And so Philip shows up and starts preaching Christ. And I'm sure that this had potential to take away from Simon's power. So let's see what the Bible says Simon did. Acts 8.13 tells us 
even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and works of power performed, he was amazed. Simon believed, and he was baptized. He's willing to kind of go along with what's happening in his culture, kind of see what's going to happen and if he can somehow benefit from it. He's awed when he sees Philip's power through the Holy Spirit. Now, Acts 8, 14 to 17 will give us some more illumination into what the Holy Spirit is and what he does. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You see, Philip's preaching and God's redemptive work in Samaria had reached back to the core church of Jerusalem where the apostles still were and the early church fathers show wisdom. Hearing that the work of Christ is growing in Samaria, they send their two most senior officials. Peter and John are talked about in the New Testament more than any other apostles. And these important men come to see what God is doing and to lay their hands on their believers there so that they may receive the same Holy Spirit that is working in Jerusalem. Did you get that? They didn't come just to sightsee. They didn't come to look around and kind of, hmm, we're curious if this is a work of God or not. They came to ensure that the Holy Spirit that they had would indwell the believers who were not from their cultural background so that with all of them, God could keep building his church universal. Remember, the Samaritans were the exact opposite of the Jews. So it was essential that strong leadership from Jerusalem come and endorse what God was doing so that we would know the church is one. And do you remember what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is? What gift they were given when they received the Holy Spirit? Galatians 5, and 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now don't miss what Simon does next. The man who is used to having power and influence sees what is happening and he wants in on it. Acts 8, 18 through 23 tells the story. Is that me? Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Wow. When Simon was offered love, joy, and peace, he wanted fame. When he was offered patience, he wanted it now. When he was offered kindness, he manipulates for power. When he was offered goodness, he wanted command. He was offered faithfulness and self-control under the Spirit of God, but he wanted control of the Spirit of God. Did you see that? Philip, Peter, and John were controlled by the Spirit. Simon wanted control of the Spirit. So what? How does that apply to us? Consider, do we allow ourselves to be filled with the spirit of love, joy, and peace? Or do we beg God to change our circumstances, to give us authority to take control, to make things the way we want them to be? Is my life characterized by prayers that have my selfish interests at heart? Or is my life characterized by asking the spirit of God to fill me that I may have his peace wherever I am.
Peter has sternly warned Simon. And here's Simon's reply in Acts 8.24. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing that you've said may come upon me. Wow. Rather than turn from his evil desires and repent, Simon just asked the apostles to pray to God for him that God will leave him alone. You see, the curtain that separated God from man in the Old Testament temple was torn in two when Christ died. Simon has to go through that temple himself into the presence of God. And if he will not enter the presence of God himself, all the prayers that the apostles might offer will be void and null. As we leave Simon, I pray that each of us will choose to be controlled by the Holy Spirit and to submit to him in our lives. Acts 8, 25 through 27a goes on and tells more of the story. Now, when they, Peter and John, had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to the many villages of the Samaritans. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Huh, this is a desert place. Huh. And he rose and went. Wait a second. Philip was in the middle of productive ministry. God was working. Samaritans were repenting. God's enemies were coming to him as his his dependents. They were trusting him in new ways. And Philip is the key part of that. He founded the movement and he's still ministering in Samaria. And God comes to him and says, I got a new plan. Go 30 miles back to Jerusalem. Go another 15 miles south by foot walk down 45 miles to a place where nobody is. There's a road that isn't used by very many people. That's where I'm sending you. Wow. That's not really what I would call glorifying. That's really what I would call humbling. And he does it. He leaves. And God has a plan. Did you know sometimes God will take us away from the group so that we can minister life to an individual? Did you know that not all of us are called to stand up here and preach, but all of us are called to be in barren wastelands so that God's word goes there as well? Acts 27b through 28 says, And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet, Isaiah. Now, wait a minute. Maybe this is why Peter read that scripture from Deuteronomy this morning. This guy was a eunuch. He had been maimed so he could not bear children. And he had been to Jerusalem to try to worship God. But if they were following the Old Testament rules, they would have blocked him out of the temple. They would have said, we have nothing to say to you. So he's got the word. He's got the Pentateuch. He's reading the prophets, but he can't make sense of it. He can't understand it. And no one from the Jewish faith is going to help him find God. He doesn't give up. He's heading home and he's reading the scripture in his chariot. And you know, the chariot isn't going fast. He's clopping along the road. Now, Philip following God's instructions is right there. He's on that desert road. And Acts 28, 29 through 35 tells us what happens. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Wow. Wow. Go and join this chariot. Go to this foreign dignitary, this non-Jew, this broken man. Go to that chariot and see what's going on. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how can I unless someone guide me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture... He told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, 
and he baptized him. Wow. Did you see that? Philip gets it. The way to God is now open to all people groups who believe. He is willing to preach the gospel to someone who is not part of God's chosen people. And the result is another miracle of a fruitful God. This powerful Ethiopian government official accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord, and he returns to the giant territory of Ethiopia, Africa, where eventually St. Augustine will come from. So never doubt that God is at work when he calls you somewhere new. Arlene asked me another question at this point. She said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What happened to the law? Do we just set it aside? What about that rule of not going into the temple? Are we just doing away with it? Or does God ignore it in the New Testament? Ooh, that's a good question. And since I don't know, I'm going to leave it for Jamie next week. Oh, no. <laughs> sorry. 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 Remember when we learned earlier that in the Old Testament, the blessing of God was found in the Jewish people. And he had given them the law, not as a system of works that they would perfect to make it to him, but as a guide to show them they were imperfect. Now that guide showing them they were imperfect has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. You do not become now a faithful follower of God by following a set of rules. Rather, you become a faithful follower of God by accepting who Christ is and what he has done. Now we're going to look at a kind of a tight scripture, kind of a difficult one, Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. We're going to look at it a portion at a time so we can see that the tension between the Old Testament laws and rules and the New Testament grace of Jesus can only be resolved one way. We're going to go through this one statement at a time. For he himself is our peace. Now the himself is Jesus. For he himself is our peace. Wait, why do we need peace? Because every one of us is standing, waiting to go into the courtroom of God for eternity with a huge bill of guilty items. A huge number of things we have done wrong. And if you're standing there going into the traffic court, knowing that the policeman has you for speeding, no seatbelt, talking on your cell phone, and reckless endangerment of a child, you are going to not feel very much peace. But if you know that the penalty is paid, that everything is wiped away, that in that hearing you are going to be completely released in freedom to live your life, you're going to feel peace. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, has made us both one. What does he mean both? Well, the Jews had a system to get to God, but it was hostile to the Gentiles who were heathens and didn't have any way to get to God. So he has taken both of those and broken down the dividing wall between them in his flesh. In him, he fulfilled both the intent of the law to show the need for God and the desire of the Gentile to have access to God apart from this system of rules and regulations. Jesus broke down that division between them. Well, how did he do that? Verse 15 says, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. In other words, he showed that it isn't just following regulations that God has for us to do. That's not going to be enough. We have to be perfect. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? If you hate someone, you've killed them. If you look at someone and think it would be nice to have sex with them, you are an adulterer. Wow. None of us within the Christian context, none of us outside the Christian context can measure up to God's holiness and his standards. So is the new standard far more difficult than the old? No. They were both impossible for humans to fulfill on their own. They were never meant to be the answer to get to God. Instead, Jesus Christ came. You are aware, aren't you, that we are all imperfect? 
We are all neutered in some way like the Ethiopian eunuch and we're disallowed from the presence of God. Each of us has tried to set up our own systems, our own ways of getting to God, our own things that we thought would make us good enough. That eunuch had traveled many miles to get close to God and yet he had failed. But God reached into that chariot and placed Philip with him and called him to himself. But God allowed Philip to be chased from Jerusalem so that he would take the Holy Spirit with him and minister life to the people of Samaria. That answer is Jesus Christ. It is through him, Paul says, that we live and we move and we have our being. Because we are identified with Christ, it's his presence alone that allows us into God's presence. We can meet God's highest standard not by being perfect, but by being in submission to his Holy Spirit and by allowing Christ to indwell us. And you know, this morning, that same Holy Spirit is active right here in this church. I was called here to preach this to you today. You were called here to hear it every bit as much as Philip was directed to the Ethiopian. Since Jesus has suffered once for all, that invitation is open to every single one of us. Yet we cannot be like Simon, grasping for control, trying to figure out how to keep the power that we have. We have to be like Philip, going where God directs, taking the Holy Spirit in who we are to direct us. We must ask God for our forgiveness ourselves. Doesn't matter what church I attend, doesn't matter what parents I have, doesn't matter what sins I've committed, doesn't matter how maimed my body is, I can come to the presence of God through the power of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 gives God's promise that we can be in relationship with him. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He goes on to say, there is now no distinction between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing your riches on all who call on you was wonderful to hear about the choice some of our youth made at camp, to step into faith as their own, to take ownership of their relationship with God and submit to him in their own heart, to call on Christ for their salvation. We know they're saved because the Bible says in that same passage, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Each of us must decide for ourselves. Every one of us must put away striving and trying to be good enough and relax in what Christ has done. It matters not what people group you're from or how maimed your body or your spirit or your emotions are. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes.